Uh, so my name is Randy Schaup. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm going to talk about moving fast at scale. So a little bit about my background. Uh, that's did a wonderful job, but I can't help maybe saying it myself. Um, so right now I'm VP of, engineer, uh, of engineering of a uh, company called Stitch Fix in the United States. If you have not heard of it yet, that's okay, because as I uh, mentioned, we're only in the United States at the moment. Um, let me say it this way. We have noticed that there are other people in the world, not just in America, that like clothes. So uh, just wait, please, patiently. Um, but we do a ton of uh, technology and data science to help figure out what kind of clothes people will like. Um, and so some of the lessons that I'm going to talk about today are, are uh, uh, from Stitch Fix. Uh, before that, I was sort of a roving consultant. My friends used to call me a CTO as a service, which I kind of liked. Uh, and I was helping companies do this kind of thing that we're going to talk about today. Uh, earlier, I was director of engineering at Google for Google App Engine. So Google App Engine is Google's platform as a service, like Heroku or Engine Yard or Cloud Foundry. And about 3 million different applications worldwide run on App Engine, including uh, Snapchat and the game Pokemon Go and a bunch of other things. Um, and then earlier, uh, as I mentioned, I was chief engineer at eBay. Um, I spent about six and a half uh, years there working on um, a bunch of different stuff, but mostly on eBay's search engine infrastructure. So I learned a ton about how to scale teams, how to scale technology, uh, and how to build a real-time search engine from scratch. So uh, this is what it's all about. Time to value. It does not matter whether we write code or not, as Mark correctly pointed out. It does not matter whether we write code. Code is one of our ways, as engineers, that we can uh, contribute to the business and help drive value. And it's not important if we drive value five years from now. It's much better if we drive value one year from now, even better one month, even better one week, even better one hour. So let's talk about how we can do one hour. Often we think that there is, we feel, maybe viscerally, that there must be some trade-off between speed and stability, right? You know, I can either go fast or I can do things properly. Does that seem intuitive? Like, yeah, I'm either I'm going to do things well or I'm going to do things quickly. Well, the wonderful thing, as I've pointed out in the intro, uh, is that actually the high-performing organizations in our industry have both. So who is familiar, I hope, with this DevOps handbook book? Many hands go up. Excellent. Uh, so, as I've mentioned, a bunch of the research that has been ba that backed uh, the DevOps handbook um, from the Puppet Lab State of DevOps reports going back several years uh, is this. So, high-performing organizations, the people who are sort of in the upper right-hand quadrant, um, are doing multiple deploys every day versus slower organizations that might be doing uh, deploys only once a month. The lead time between when I am finished typing as a developer and I can deploy it to site might be as low as an hour. Um, whereas in slower organizations, it might take a day or a week uh, or even longer. Um, and also, I, in these high-performing organizations, we are uh, recovering from failure more quickly. So the mean time to recovery is lower. So instead of maybe taking one day to recover from some site outage or some bug that we released um, to our customers, instead we're doing that in maybe less than an hour. And also, the change failure rate. So the percentage of time that I uh, deploy something uh, to the site or I deploy things to customers and I have to roll them back or hot fix them or something like that uh, approaches zero in these high performing organizations. Whereas in the poor performing organizations, it might be as much as a third to a half of, uh, of the things that we do. So as you will correctly notice, these things are about speed and these things are about stability. So our intuition here is wrong. We can have both speed and stability. And in fact, exactly the same practices that we're going to talk about today that help us to be fast also are those processes that help us to be more stable and produce more solid code. Does it make sense? Cool. So we're going to talk about how to do that. Uh, so we can actually have, as I said, speed and stability together. But you know what? It's not just for engineers. Those four metrics I talked about were sort of engineering metrics, like those are cool for us, um, but even more importantly are how it affects business goals. As again, uh, I've pointed out in the intro, these companies that are in that high performing quadrant are two and a half times more likely to meet and exceed the goals of profitability, of market share, or productivity. So DevOps matters directly to the business. The things that we do and that we learn today in this room we go back and we take it back to our businesses and we make the businesses better, very directly. 
Okay, I want to talk about five different areas. First, I want to talk about how we organize ourselves for speed. I want to talk about what to build and even more importantly, what not to build. I want to talk about when to build things, which is about prioritization. I want to talk about how to build things. And finally, I want to end with delivering and operating. So first, let's talk about organizing for speed. Uh, who has heard in this room about Conway's Law? A good number of people, great. Uh, so uh, Mel Conway in 1968 uh, made an observation, which is that software, software organizations that he worked with, he noticed that uh, the architecture that the organization produced was a reflection of the organization. Or as we might say flippantly in the US, you ship your org chart. You ship your org chart, yeah? Uh, if you've ever gone to the website maybe of, I don't know, a big bank or a financial institution, you can often see the org chart in the website. Does that sound familiar? Like, oh, this is the retirement section, which has an entirely different you know, uh, user experience. And this is the you know, investment section or something like that. I recently bought a house, uh, and so I was going to my financial institutions on a multi-daily basis, I'm sorry to say. Um, and I did absolutely notice every single one of them was shipping their org chart to their site. Uh, so in particular, what, um, uh, uh, what Conway noticed is that um, the or architecture is a reflection of the communication paths within the organization. So what's interesting, though, is that Conway meant this as a descriptive law. He was describing what he saw in those organizations he worked with. But actually, we can use this in a normative way. We can use this law to our advantage. So if the organization is going to determine the architecture, Let's imagine that we want to have an architecture built out of small, modular, independent components. So what if we then started with a, an organization that is built out of small, modular, independent teams? Does it make sense? And this is exactly the experience that I've had, and maybe many of you have had, where in a large organization with large teams, we tend to build this sort of spaghetti, interrelated, uh, monolithic software. Whereas if we build our, if we make our organization with the same number of people, if we organize ourselves in small teams with well-defined areas of responsibility, we actually will end up building a more modular architecture. So we can engineer the system that we want by first engineering organization. It's a bit, seems a bit reverse, right? But it's actually, and it's actually a little bit counterintuitive, I'll say even to me, but, it's, but it works. Okay, so what do I mean by engineering the organization? Let's build our engineering organization out of small, I'll call them service teams. So uh, let's have teams be full stack, exactly as in Mark's example in the previous keynote. Um, and let's form those teams out of a small number of people. Uh, people have probably, are probably familiar with this idea from Amazon of a two pizza team. Yeah, two pizza teams. Yeah, so that, that, that uh, word actually comes from Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, I'm told. Um, and the idea is that no team should be larger than can be fed by two large pizzas. And the funny corollary that my Amazon friends tell me is that it actually means that we can't have too many junior people on the team because they eat too much pizza. Uh, so typically the size of the team, you know, depending on people's hunger, might be four people to six people, something like that. But the key idea is that it's small, but that it's also full stack. So within that team boundary, uh, within that team boundary, we have all the skill sets that we need to do our job. It's also important, as with Mark's example, that we align the goals of the team with something that actually matters to the business. Does it make sense? So in Stitch Fix, we do clothing. So we buy clothes, and I have a team that builds operation, uh, applications for the buyers of clothes. We put the clothes in actual physical warehouses. I have several sets of teams that build tools and applications for the warehouse employees. Uh, we um, style you. We, uh, we're going to decide five items to put in a box that we send to you. We have 3,500 human stylists that are making those styling choices on your behalf. And so I have another team that builds the applications uh, for the stylists. And ditto for customer support, for finance, et cetera, et cetera. So all my teams are organized around specific business domains with a, with a partner business team typically and with, uh, with shared goals with the business. So exactly how Mark described doing it at USCIS. And how are we gonna grow the team? So Stitch Fix, when I joined two years ago, had 25 engineers, now we have 125. So in two years, we've grown 5X. Um, and how do we grow the teams? We grow through, uh, from something high school, in high school biology, cellular mitosis. Do people remember from high school biology? So um, uh, when an organism starts, perhaps one of you, 
for one of your children. We're going to start as one cell. That cell will divide into two cells. Those two cells will divide into four cells, etc. Right? Mitosis? Please not. Mitosis? Yes. Excellent. Great. Uh, so uh, that's how we build. That's how we grow the teams. So we start out with one team that's responsible, say, for the styling area, and then as we need to do more, uh, we subdivide that team again along business boundaries, and we go from there. Great. Uh, so, when I have these autonomous teams, what in the world do I do as VP of engineering, right? So I give the team a goal and then I walk away. Do I get to go on vacation? No. Uh, I wish that I could. Um, but what I do, what's my job, or one of the most important parts of my job, is helping to scope what the teams are responsible for. Does it make sense? One of the jobs of leadership in this agile and DevOps uh, organizations is helping to figure out the withdrawing those team boundaries and giving the teams the appropriate goal so that they can be independently productive. And so a goal that I set for myself in this, um, and the number's not super important, but, I sh but what I want to have is if I can draw team boundaries where most of the uh, project work that the team is working on is within the team boundary, then I've done a good job. Does it make sense? And if a team is mostly having to coordinate with one or two or 10 or 100 other teams, then probably we haven't done our, uh, uh, our um, uh, we haven't drawn the scope of the team uh, very effectively. Now I say 80% instead of 100% because almost by definition the strategic priorities of my company are going to cross multiple teams. Does it make sense? Like the really big things that we're going to do overall as Stitch Fix uh, are going to uh, typically cross multiple teams. So I don't say anything more than 80, but I would like it to be uh, most of the team's work uh, to be done within the team boundary. Great. Uh, so that's about organizing for speed. Now let's figure out what we're going to build when we're in the team. So um, if you remember nothing else from this presentation, I'd ask you to take back to your organizations these seven words. What problem are you trying to solve? So have you ever had this experience where you know, you're in an IT organization uh, and you have one of your business partners or product people, they come to you and, you, and they say, hey, could you please add a button you know, to do this thing? Does anybody have that experience? Seriously, nobody has had that experience? Okay, great, please, yeah, let's have this be more interactive, thanks. Uh, so many of us have had this experience where a business person comes to me with what? A solution. So my response is, uh, great, we can absolutely add that button, but let's have this conversation. What problem are you trying to solve? Does it make sense? If I can get the business or product person to help articulate the problem, then often I can help uh, solve the problem, maybe in the way that they suggested. So maybe the right thing to do is for my team to build a button, that's fine. But maybe there's another way to solve that problem that has other better characteristics because it's faster, because it's more integrated with the rest of the system, uh, and so on. Um, and what's interesting, uh, and sorry, um, if I do not know what problem I'm trying to solve, I am very likely to build the wrong thing. Does it make sense? If I don't even know what I'm doing, what in the world you know, am I doing? Um, and what is also fun as an engineer is that as, as I develop more of a knowledge about and an intuition for the business problems, I now can use my brain. So instead of just the one business brain or product brain, we also have an engineer brain there helping to, in partnership, figure out what to do next. And a thing that I do want to um, emphasize for the engineers in the room, which I imagine is most of us, is we have a power and a skill set that we probably don't fully appreciate. So uh, I am weird. I have a, both a political science degree and also a degree in sort of engineering and computer science. Um, and so what's the way to say this? As part of my engineering training, I learned discipline problem solving. I learned different skills in my political science. So. The, uh, so what we might not fully appreciate about ourselves is people that come to these problems from a non-engineering background have probably not uh, learned the skills or at least practiced the skills regularly of discipline problem solving. And that is what we can do, right? So the business person gives me a problem. I would like to move the metric of, you know, a number of cases per adjudicator, you know, higher. Great. Now um, I can uh, help to uh, break that problem down as, with my engineering mindset and apply an engineering discipline to the problem. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. So what problem are we trying to solve? If we are able to define the problem well, then we can avoid doing this. 
So uh, if, once you've bought Mark's book, the next book you should buy is uh, this wonderful book, which is called Lean Software Development by Mary and Tom Poppendick. So I reread it recently because I was going to meet with them personally, uh, recently, and it was written in 2003. You will not believe, if you read it again or, or for the first time, how incredibly prescient and how incredibly modern it is. This book was written 15 years ago, and every single practice in there is about exactly what we're trying to talk about today, DevOps and Agile. And we don't even use, the word DevOps didn't even exist then. Um, but they laid out a way of, develop, of developing software in a very high quality way, uh, in a very quick way, um, even back in 2003. It's an excellent, excellent book. So what they say is, building the wrong thing is the biggest waste that we can have in software development. And what I would say, you know, in addition to that, if we build the wrong thing, 100% of our effort in building that thing is wasted. Does it make sense? If we built the wrong thing, we should rather have gone on vacation. Like it would have been better if we had done nothing rather than build the wrong thing. Okay, uh, so what problem are we trying to solve? This is obvious, but uh, how shall I say it? Common sense is not that common. So what we should be doing as we think about our problem is figure out what actual business met metric we're gonna move, what actual business value we're gonna produce. Uh, and it's possible, as Mark pointed out, that I might be able to solve the problem without any technology at all. <coughs> like maybe I don't need to build a button, maybe as we talk through with our engineering mindset, uh, with our, engineering, with our uh, disciplined uh, approach to the problem, maybe we could change the business process. Maybe we could uh, do something manually for a while before automating it, because maybe we're not even sure if the process is correct. But there are lots of techniques that we can use as we're having this conversation with the business person uh, that try to figure out what would be the best solution to the problem in the moment. Uh, I like this quote from Charles Kettering, who used to be the head of uh, engineering, or sorry, the head of research at General Motors. Um, a problem well stated is a problem half solved. So once we have come to this common understanding of a problem, uh, not only do I feel better because I actually understand the business, not only have I contributed my brain to the problem solving uh, uh, situation, rather than just uh, only the um, uh, business brain and I'm an order taker, but also I'm probably halfway to the solution. So any of us who've done any mathematics for serious know that ma modern mathematics is really not about solving equations, it's about formulating the problem in a way that makes it amenable to solution. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? So when Andrew Wiles cracked uh, uh, Fermat's last theorem, you know, it was a problem that had been around for several hundred years, he spent seven years not solving equations, but seven years formulating and reformulating and re-re-reformulating the problem in a way that was amenable to solution by a bunch of really seemingly unrelated areas of mathematics. Does it make sense? Cool, all right, great. We have now decided that there is something we're going to build, but maybe we don't have to build it. Yeah, so there's software that now has to be written. There's a software solution to the problem that we have identified, but maybe it doesn't have to be my team that builds it. Uh, so a thing that we might do in 2018 is leverage cloud infrastructure. So I have 125 engineers, they're very talented, um, but uh, I would much rather have them work on stitch fix specific things rather than building and maintaining uh, physical infrastructure. Does it make sense? So for me, it helps a lot to do that. And uh, as a consequence, uh, at Stitch Fix, you know, we have the benefit of being, you know, only six or seven years old. Um, but uh, at Stitch Fix, we actually have no owned physical infrastructure basically anywhere in the world. So we have our laptops, and we have some Wi-Fi devices in our, net, in our uh, warehouses, and that's pretty much it. Everything else is, you know, in the magical cloud. And, I mean, there are real machines there and real physical stuff, but we don't run it. Uh, Mark's company does. Cool. So, uh, all right, I've done that. I've sort of made infrastructure not my problem. I've made it Mark's company's problem. Uh, and so now I want to see if, hey, I, build, I need to build some software. But maybe I can leverage some open source capabilities. And the wonderful thing in 2018, as distinct from when I joined this industry in 1990, you know, look at my head. I've been around for a long time. Um, there's a lot of great open source software here. So particularly in the so-called you know, DevOps or infrastructure areas, you know, Kubernetes and Docker and Istio, uh, and open source databases like MySQL and Postgres, uh, open source um, uh, search engines like Elasticsearch, which was founded by Israeli. Um, 
machine learn model. So as I mentioned briefly, we do a ton of machine learning at Stitch Fix. We're not writing the fundamental you know, neural net algorithms. That's something that we can get for free, essentially, um, in the global community. But what we do is we put our models on top of those uh, standard algorithms. So we, we definitely leverage a ton of open source. Uh, and I suggest that you should try that, too, at least to think about it ahead of time. Um, and usually in 2018, a lot of these systems, a lot of these uh, pieces of software from open source are actually better than the commercial alternative. Cool. All right. So um, what's the way to say it? Well, uh, so at Stitch Fix, uh, the other thing that's even better than uh, open source that I run myself is a system that somebody else runs on my behalf. So at Stitch Fix, we use 50, more than 50, third-party services for all sorts of stuff, you know, monitoring and alerting and all sorts of operational stuff. We use it for uh, project management. We use it for bug tracking. Uh, we use it for payments because we are not an expert in financial stuff. So we'd much rather pay another company to run our payments infrastructure and do all that kind of stuff. Fraud detection, et cetera, et cetera, times 50 different services. So the wonderful thing, uh, capabilities that we have in 2018 is we can completely, uh, I can completely make these very hard problems somebody else's problem, not mine. Does it make sense? Cool. All right. And what this allows me to do is focus on my own core competency. So I have my 125 engineers fully building stitch fixy things, and the undifferentiated heavy lifting, as we say in AWS, um, is left to somebody else. Okay. Uh, here's what I like to say. Soon it's going to be just as common to run your own data center as it is to run your own electrical power generation. So there are companies that are at the appropriate scale where they do run their own power. Um, but a quick little story. Uh, when Henry Ford in the 1910s started doing, uh, building automobiles in the United States and started doing assembly lines, what do you think the first thing that, he, that his company needed to do when they wanted to uh, site a new automobile factory? They needed to find a river. Why? Because the river was the place where they could get power. Does it make sense? So at that time, in the early days of automobile manufacturing, the first concern of a factory you know, manager was, where am I going to get my power? And then, I'm, you know, and then I can go from there and actually build my factory. But that's no longer true. Right? We can essentially put factory, we can put heavy industry almost anywhere on the planet because they, we have the electrical grid. And I think at some point, we're going to get to the same place uh, with computing. Okay. Uh, the other thing about building the right thing is not knowing ahead of time what we're building, and so experiments are a great way to help to refine our ideas about what will work and what won't. And particularly at a company like Stitch Fix, where we do a ton of data science, this is a really, uh, what's the way to say it? The data scientists won't let us engineers get away with sloppy thinking. So up front, we have to state our hypothesis. So we say, uh, we want to move the, I don't know, the efficiency of the stylists from you know, 10 units to 12 units, whatever that means. Um, so we, we have a particular metric that we want to move, and we have some hypothesis about the direction and the magnitude of that movement. So obviously, we need to know what the current value of the metric is, right? So we need to start by knowing what the baseline is, and then we have some hypothesis about how we might want to move it. So then, we run an actual A-B test, right? I'm sure people in the room here are familiar with what I mean by A-B test. What I mean is, at the same time, I have a control group, which has the old experiment, and I have a treatment group, or maybe several treatment groups, uh, that have the new uh, version of the experiment. Uh, and I run them both in parallel, and I look and see what is the difference in the outcome between the control group and the treatment groups. Um, and uh, 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 I, run the, I run that for a while, and then I get some statistically significant results, um, and then I go from there. Um, as part of this, I want to be obsessively logging and measuring. Why? Because I'm going to run this experiment, and it's going to be a success or a failure. I don't know. Um, and then I'm going to run another experiment, and another experiment, and another experiment. And so I log all the um, sort of infrastructure-related metrics, you know, the machine and uh, uh, related behavior. And I also log all the user behavior to give myself the insights to figure out why this experiment maybe succeeded or failed, and what to do next. Does it make sense? Cool. All right. Uh, I'll, give some two, I'll give two examples from eBay, actually, about where we applied these techniques. So again, as I mentioned, I worked on the search engine at eBay, and people may be familiar with uh, something called a ranking function in a search engine. So that's the thing when you do the query on Google, uh, that's the thing that decides what order the result should be in, right? The ranking function decides 
should, what uh, should this result be in the first position, the tenth position, the hundredth position, etc. Um, and eBay had a similar idea to uh, to this, you know. So we had a ranking function. Uh, initially, though, that ranking function was sort of hand-tuned by a product manager, and it was a very smart product manager. Uh, but it only took a handful of factors, right? So it was human constructed. You know, it's a, li a simple linear combination of a couple of different factors, which were, both, were basically uh, guessed about. Um, and our intuition, our hypothesis, was that if we used hundreds or maybe thousands of factors that could go into the, the ranking function, we could do a better job. So we embarked on what ended up being a year of in incremental experimentation. So we ran a bunch of, we had a bunch of, um, we developed some sort of uh, predictive models about how um, uh, our users would traverse through the eBay site. So first they would query, then they would look at an item, they would look at the item, and then they might buy it or bid on it, et cetera. So we developed, we developed some uh, segments of the, uh, of the flow, and we, we uh, uh, developed machine learning models to um, uh, develop the ranking function there. And we were running hundreds of parallel eBay, uh, A-B tests all the time for a year. Um, and each one of those incremental improvements, like none of those incremental improvements was a huge uh, uh, benefit in itself, but each one would make like 0.01% improvement. But after a year of, you know, improve, 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 we got this. So by this work and this work alone, we generated a 2% increase in the overall revenue of the eBay company, which at that time was 120 million US dollars every year. So I felt pretty proud of the teams I was associated with uh, to do that. Does that make sense? All right, at the same time, we did another set of experiments. So the hypothesis here was that if we made searching on eBay faster, people would buy more. Uh, and you might laugh and think, well, that's obvious, but I cannot tell you how difficult and challenging it was for me to convince the business people that instead of building them one new feature, that I should make the existing features faster. But I did a long, you know, it took a long uh, time for me to convince them, but finally we got to that point, and here's what the results were. Uh, so again, we did this iterative process, so again, we made a bunch of incremental improvements, none of which by itself was huge, but in aggregate uh, moved the needle quite a lot. So we got another 2% increase in the overall revenue of the company, so another 120 million US dollars. So if I add these two things together, the improvements that we made to the machine learning ranking function and the improvements that we made to site speed, we basically got a quarter billion US dollars every year. So experimentation works. Yeah? This is about how to apply experimentation and drive business results. Does it make sense? Cool. All right. That was about, uh, we talked about organizing for speed. We talked about what to build and what not to build. Now I'd like to talk about when to build things. And when I say when to build, I mean uh, basically prioritization. So raise your hand if you have more resources and people than you need to do what you want to do. <laughs> Let the record show, Your Honor, that no hands went up. Okay, me neither. We live in a world of scarce resources. We never have enough uh, people and resources to do all the things we would like to do, of course. Uh, so, and so that means we have to prioritize. Because we have scarce resources, we have to decide what to do and what not to do. And this is an idea from economics, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but there's an idea here of opportunity cost, right? If we decide to do X, we are implicitly deciding not to do anything else that was not X. Does it make sense? We decide to do one thing, and we are deciding implicitly not to do anything else. That's what's called opportunity cost. Great. Uh, and a way to think about prioritization is to think about where is a way that we, where are the places where we can put the, get the biggest bang for the buck as we say. So where can we make a reasonable investment and get a big payoff, a small investment and get a medium sized payoff, etc. So we should be thinking about what are ways that we can prioritize based on an expected set of business value uh, versus the investment that we're going to make. Okay. I asked you to remember seven words. If you're willing to remember four more, I'd suggest that these would be four more to remember. Fewer things, more done. So this is my restatement of the idea uh, of limiting work in progress. Yeah? So an idea that comes from lean manufacturing, which is part of you know, the DevOps milieu, uh, is um, that we should limit with. We should, not, we should not do a ton of things in parallel, but we should do a smaller number of things so that we actually get them completed. So this is how, I will say this openly, uh, this is how I was running on my projects at Stitch Fix even a year ago. 
So let's imagine that I had five people and I had a whole pile of priorities and I would put you know, one person on the first priority, one, a, a second person on the second priority, et cetera. Does anybody manage their projects like this? Come on. Really, I'm the only one? I don't buy it. Uh, so this is how I was managing the projects. But in even better, and notice in this way, I'm treating the fifth priority with the same amount of resources as the first. Does it make sense what I'm doing here? Yeah, so here's a better way. What if I did this? This is assuming that two people would be valuable on the first priority, which is a separate assumption, you know, let's imagine making. Um, but let's imagine that my first priority, and it would, let's imagine that it would be valuable to have two people work together on that first priority project. Great, let's have them do it and get it done. And oh, by the, uh, for the second priority, yeah, that could also benefit from two people. Let's get them working on it together and get that thing done. And then the third priority, well, you know, that actually was an a one-person project and additional people wouldn't have helped. Does this make sense? So what are the benefits that we got here? First off, if we were, God forbid, if we were wrong about how long things might take, that never happens in our industry, right? Uh, if, we were un if we were unclear on how long something might take, at least we got the first and second priorities done, right? That's literally what it means to be a priority. So I put as much effort as I could, or as much uh, resources as I could behind the first priority, then behind the second priority, and only then would I imagine uh, putting some resources behind the third. And then when the first and second uh, you know, sets of people uh, were done, you know, then they could, do, uh, could work on the other projects. Does this make sense? And here I'm not even assuming that by putting two people together, we might actually be able to do it faster, and we might be able to deliver it incrementally in between. But simply the idea of limiting whip putting fewer people on, more, on you know, fewer things, more done, um, I got more be uh, benefit from my business faster. So as you can probably imagine, there's a, a people are probably familiar with the idea of uh, time value of money. So 1,000 shekels today is not worth as much as 1,000 shekels, uh, is worth more than 1,000 shekels one month from now, six months from now, one year from now, right? And the same is true of features. So simply by delivering these top two priorities more quickly, I have delivered more business value faster to my customers. Okay, fewer things, more done. I have delivered my full value earlier. Yeah, I've delivered those first and second priorities earlier than I otherwise would. Uh, and I have started the process of delivering incrementally. Even better would be if I had even smaller milestones along the way, that would be even better. Um, but I've delivered increments along the way and delivered you know, working systems uh, in a shorter period of time. Uh, and also, uh, I have found, this is not always true, but I have found that by maybe putting two people together, they can actually help one another, and maybe they can actually move faster, right? So the second person can unblock the first person, they can use two brains instead of one, that sort of thing. Does this make sense? Great, okay. Uh, and then here's you know, the, next, uh, the, ne the related idea, is once I've solved problem number one, problem two gets a promotion, yeah? So I've done my first priority, now my second priority becomes my first, et cetera. All right, cool. So that's about when to build things. Now I'd like to talk about how to build them. And in particular, I want to use another phrase that comes out of lean manufacturing, which is moving quality to the left. Now we're assuming that it's left to right. Of course, here we might say moving quality to the right, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, so to me, if we talk about uh, priorities, I like to think of quality and reliability as priority zero, uh, priority zero features. Why? Because if my website is not up, it does not matter how pretty it is. Yeah? If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter how many features there are. Okay. So as a consequence, full stack teams are going to make this happen. So for my, for my teams, I don't have developers that do, uh, I don't have like uh, developers that type, developers that test, and then separately developers that operate. I just have developers. And so within my team boundary, my developers are responsible for building the features, for making sure the features have high quality, for making sure the features perform, for making sure the features uh, are manageable and operable, and they're also responsible for carrying the pager when things go wrong. So this is a way of helping to reduce the cycle time, to speed up those feedback loops, and to ensure that quality, you know, we put quality in from the beginning. The way that we do this at Stitch Fix, which is a common practice, um, not as common as it should be, uh, is test-driven development. So for me, um, 
I'm not super uh, strict about the definition, so I don't need us to write the tests before we write the code, but I, it is part of my definition of done. So if, if we're gonna build a feature, we are not done with that feature until the feature is complete, and we also have written automated tests to make sure that the feature doesn't break in the future. And I don't do this to slow things down, I do, things to I do this to speed things up. So uh, in the last several mornings, I've been running along the beautiful beach in Herzliya. And so you can imagine, well, ask yourself this question. Is it faster for Randy to run on solid ground, or is it faster for Randy to run on the sand? Solid ground. That's what tests give me. Tests are my solid ground, right? It helps me not slip back, you know, as I would if I'm running on sand. Um, and it helps me to move forward faster. Okay, tests make better code because it gives me, because I have the tests, it gives me the confidence to potentially break things. Like I'm willing to be more courageous in the changes that I make to my code, uh, willing to refactor it mercilessly because I have the tests that can make sure whether I've bro uh, broken something or not. Tests help make better systems because it allows us to catch bugs earlier in the process. Again, move quality to the left. Uh, and it and allows us to, um, uh, to fail faster. So Microsoft did a, a really interesting study about what developers actually do day to day, uh, and it was pretty surprising. Uh, but actually, once I started thinking about it, it actually did align with my experience. So if you work in a mature code base, your developers might be doing something like this. So imagine that they're spending something like 75% of their time simply reading and understanding existing code, Maybe they're spending 20% of their time, you know, modifying that existing code, and then probably only 5% of, of your time in a mature code base is spent uh, writing new code. Well, so you can imagine that test-driven development uh, improves these two areas very directly. Yeah? So test-driven development helps me understand existing code. Why? Because tests are executable documentation. Yeah? Tests are executable documentation. How in the world do I use this class? Oh, I'm gonna look at the tests. The tests say, you know, call this method, then they call that other method, et cetera. So the tests by themselves, even if you had no other documentation, are, are a clear way that indicates how that particular class or interface or service is intended to be used. So it helps me to understand existing code. Well, obviously it helps me to modify existing code because I'm, more, um, more courageous and more able to make modifications to the existing code because the tests will catch whether I've broken anything. And oh, by the way, it actually helps me when I'm writing new code because uh, by, if I want to, if I'm not done with my new code until I also have tests, writing code in a testable way helps me, helps to force me to write in a more uh, componentized, uh, easier to test way. So it actually is a good enforcement of good uh, software engineering principles like encapsulation and abstraction and all that kind of stuff. Does it make sense? Okay. Has anybody heard this? We don't have time to do it right. Yes, lots of laughter, few hands, but enough laughter that I, I know you have heard. Okay, here's what I say. Do you have time to do it twice? That's the choice. That is often the choice. So if I'm gonna build a thing halfway, and I'm saying a different word in my head. If I'm gonna build it halfway, uh, that is not as good, uh, two things halfway are not as good as one thing all the way. Okay, and by the way, if you do that, your users are gonna thank you. So anybody who carries one of these, which is everybody in the room, uh, the last time you have, you know, I don't know, added a new application or updated the operating system, how many times have you said, wow, I'm so glad that they added 57 new features in the new release? <laughs> said no one ever. What you're interested in, though, is that the several features that you care about actually work. Yeah? So not only is it better for your development team to focus on a smaller number of things and get them done, it's better for your users. And in fact, the more constrained you are on time and resources, the more important it is to build it right the first time. Why? Because if I only have a handful of people in my team I don't have time to go back and fix a broken thing that I was supposed to already be done with. Yeah? Again, this is solid ground. Do one thing, get it solid, move forward. So what do I mean by build it right? So I do not mean build it perfect. 
right? Is, I mean, build the minimal viable feature, yeah? By reference, again, to the Lean Startup with Eric Ries. So don't build the perfect, beautiful thing with a bow on top. Build exactly what you need in a very straightforward way and no more. So people are probably familiar with this 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle. You know, 20% of the effort goes with, it gives 80% of the value and the reverse. You know, the last 20% of the value requires 80% of the effort on the average. Um, what I'm suggesting is doing that 20% effort with the 80% value. And I want to be clear that in, when you are making a choice between building something with good quality and building maybe fewer features, I want you to always choose build a smaller number of features with higher quality. Does it make sense? Because then you can move forward quickly. Okay. Uh, the effect that this has at Stitch Fix is a really wonderful one. And I can say uh, how wonderful it is because this, uh, these practices were already in place at Stitch Fix two years ago when I joined, so I can't personally take uh, credit for them, so that's why I can tell you with all modesty how great they are. So Stitch Fix basically doesn't have a bug tracking system. So what I'm not saying is we don't produce bugs. Like our, our developers are just as wonderful and just as terrible as anybody else across the world. We do not have magically talented developers. But we have a pretty good process, right? When people are writing code, they write the tests, and we catch the bugs. So why, do we, why are we able to get away without a global bug tracking system? It's because the vast majority of bugs have already been found during the development process through the testing process, yeah? And when bugs get you know, released to customers, as absolutely happens, so you know, we're human and software is hard, so when we release uh, bugs to customers, they, that happens at a small, at a, a rare enough cadence that we just simply fix it. Does it make sense? We, we simply fix it. So I completely appreciate and also have lived in worlds where we have this, you know, the bug tracking system has thousands and thousands of bugs that we know we're never gonna get to. Um, I would suggest that if we can avoid getting into that situation, we'll be better off. Okay. Uh, so that was how to build things. The last section I want to talk about is how to deliver and operate software at scale. So uh, I'll add maybe six more words. If you're good with you know, seven and four, I'll add six more. You build it, you run it. So this comes from Werner Vogel, the CTO of, uh, of Amazon. Uh, I love this idea of ownership. So if my team is building a piece of software, my team is also responsible for managing and operating that software. Uh, and what that implies is end-to-end -end ownership of things that my teams build. So again, this connects very directly to the idea of a full stack team, right? So I need within my team boundary all the skill sets to do the job, right? I need the development, skill, the design skill set, the development skill set, the quality skill set, et cetera, et cetera. Teams last for a while. So we build products rather than doing projects, yeah? we build products rather than doing projects. So a product team that is directly aligned with a business function can take long-term ownership of the area that they, that they work on. That has several wonderful qualities. First off, the, pe the engineers on the team actually get to learn about and appreciate and love the particular domain that they're in. Does it make sense? Often we will come to a new area and it will seem unfamiliar and maybe uninteresting, but the more we learn about that area, the more we do it, the more we get excited about it, the more you know, our brain thinks about it and the more, uh, the more motivated we are. And as, a, as another consequence, we don't have a separate, we don't have like one team that builds the new cool things and another team that maintains the old terrible things. Uh, we have the same team if you've built an old terrible thing, you know, the same team is maintaining that old terrible thing in addition to building a new thing. Does it make sense? It puts the incentives in the right place where the team that is building the software is strongly incented to build it with high quality, to build it with good performance, to build it with good manageability. Why? Because if it goes wrong in the middle of the night, it's that team, it's my team that gets woken up. Does it make sense? Great. Okay. Uh, another thing that we do in terms of delivering and operating is we try to make sure that we can deliver on a very rapid cadence. Remember back to the high performing organizations and this is one of the characteristics of uh, the, the, the organizations that are in that high performing quadrant. So we build a repeatable deployment pipeline. You know, conceptually the developers just press a button and they say, uh, you know, I 
I submit my code, now please build it and automatically deploy it. And so I have another team that maintains this pipeline, but that team is responsible only for maintaining the pipeline, and it's the individual development teams that are responsible for orchestrating and um, uh, deciding when to deploy. Does it make sense? Like nobody else other than the team that builds the application is deciding when and how uh, to deploy it. Most applications at Stitch Fix are deployed multiple times a day. So anytime a developer makes a change, uh, she hits you know commit in her IDE. It goes you know we use GitHub. It goes to Git. It gets all the tests get run, and then it gets automatically deployed uh, out to the site. And this leads, as you can imagine, to much more solid systems, right? It allows us to have a faster release cadence so we can produce value to the business more quickly, but also it allows us to release smaller batch sizes, yeah? So why are smaller batch sizes good? They are good because I'm delivering that value to, to the business earlier, but also simply because the unit of deployment is smaller, I have a... I have less cognitive load, it's a lot easier for me to understand what this change is gonna be. Does it make sense? So if something goes wrong, because something always goes wrong, software is hard, there's only a small amount of change that could have caused that bug. So it's a lot easier for, for me to figure out what might have gone wrong, and also frankly, if the solution is just to roll it back, it's really easy for me to roll it back. Does it make sense? So simply by there's so many benefits, but simply by allowing my teams to deploy smaller units of work, it allows the result to be much more solid, exactly because if anything goes wrong, it's very easy for us to detect it, to diagnose it, to remediate it, uh, to mitigate it, and to remediate it. Okay. The last thing is, once something has gone wrong, what is the cultural aspect of what we do next? So people are probably familiar, I hope, in this DevOps uh, world with this idea of blameless postmortems. So a postmortem, as I'm sure we know, is when there is a dead body, there is a doctor that, figure, that does a postmortem analysis and figures out why that body is dead. Okay, similar idea to software, although hopefully nobody's gonna die. Uh, so at, after every incident, we do a postmortem. So we uh, document what happened. So at 4.02, Randy pressed the red button. At 4.03, everything caught on fire, something like that. Um, we document all the things that went right because those are the things we're gonna wanna do more of, yeah? Those are the things that were really successful. And then we also document the things that went wrong. Because clearly something went wrong. Uh, we have an open and honest discussion with all of the stakeholders. So with this cross-functional team that includes business people, product people, engineers, et cetera, all the people are in the room having the discussion about uh, what could we have done better, how could we potentially have improved the situation. And then, uh, what is so amazing, every time I see it, I'm still, uh, it, you know, brings a wonderful tear to my eye, is this. If you make this a safe space, if and only if you make this a blameless postmortem that is about how do we improve for the future rather than how do we blame in the past, this is the result. I have seen this, seen this over and over again. Engineers are almost competing with each other to say who, you know, whose responsibility it was. Uh, oh yeah, you think your team was bad. You know, my team wasn't even taking backups and our replication wasn't working and you know, all this stuff was corrupted. Um, and I saw, I've seen that at many companies. I see that at Stitch Fix, I saw that at Google many times. And so that seems crazy, right? Why would people you know, raise their hand and say, yeah, I also screwed up too? Have you ever had this reaction as an engineer? I have been saying for months, this system was broken, and I'm very sorry that it broke, and I'm very sorry that it, uh, you know, customers were impacted, but finally, we have the management priority and you know, the, the, the uh, um, opportunity to fix it. Has anybody had that experience? Yeah, many hands went up. Yeah, me too. So this is the place in the engineer's heart where this comes from, right? So finally, we prioritize this, can prioritize fixing this broken thing. All right. So at the end of the, of the uh, postmortem, we come out with action items. What are we going to do? How are we going to improve our documentation, our process, our technology? And then this is the other job of leadership, follow up. Yeah? As leaders, we need to make sure that we don't just document all the things that we should do better and then forget about it. We need to make sure those things you know, go on the backlog or you know, get prioritized in some way versus all the other features that we need to build. But we need to make sure that things actually happen. So this is the you know, quotation that I like to end this section with from one of my favorite presidents in US history. Failure is not falling down. 
It's refusing to get back up. So we talked about organizing. We talked about figuring out what to build. We talked about when to build things, how to build things, and finally about operating and delivering the stuff uh, that we built. And again, let's remember, we don't do this for ourselves. Okay, we also do it for ourselves. But we do it for our business partners as well. We do it to make the overall business more successful, and this is what we get. So again, time to value, that is what we, that is what we deliver to the business, and the better that we can do, the better job that we can do at that, the happier that we can be, and the more successful the companies that we work at will be. Well done.